Buongiorno. Fa ingresso il Presidente della Repubblica. Ingresso il Presidente della Repubblica.
Mr. President, Madam Minister, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends from all over the world, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all today to the opening ceremony of the 21st International Union for Quaternary Research Congress here in Sapienza University of Rome. On behalf of the organizing committee, I extend a warm welcome to President Sergio Mattarella and Minister Anna Maria Bernini, whose presence here today truly honors researchers, scientists, and scholars from around the world who are dedicated to the study of our planet's past and its impact on our present and future. President Mattarella, your presence here today underscores the importance of scientific research and its role in shaping our understanding of the world. Your committing to fostering a culture of innovation and intellectual curiosity has been a driving force behind Italy's scientific community. And we are deeply honored by all participation in this momentous occasion. Minister Bernini, your dedication to promoting scientific excellence and fostering collaboration between academia, industry, and government is truly commendable. Your presence here today signifies the importance of government support in advancing research and underscores the significance of international cooperation in addressing global challenges. I would also like to extend my gratitude to our magnificent rector, Antonella Polimeni, to our vice rector, Professor Giuseppe Ciccaroni, to the governance and administrative offices of Sapienza, to our organizing committee, and to all the participants who have contributed their time, expertise, and enthusiasm to make this Congress possible. To explain how this adventure started many years ago, I give the floor to the creative, enthusiastic, and tireless chair of the 21st INQUA Congress, Professor Francesco Chiocci. Thank you, Laura. Mr. President of the Republic, uh, estimate, estimated uh, uh, Minister of University of Research and Distinguished Vice Rector and dear colleagues. Here we are. Over 10 years have passed uh, since uh, an evening uh, in a brewery in Bern uh, during the 18 INQUA Congress, when a few of us conceived the idea that uh, seemed a little crazy of proposing Italy as the candidate to host uh, the INQUA Congress one of the most important events on a global scale for the study of the quaternary that is the recent evolution of our planet. It was a challenge, uh, first for, and foremost for us, but we believe that the uh, Italian quaternary community deserved it, both for the work of those who came before us, and for the current state of the research, and for those that will follow us. When I talk about those who came before us, I'm not referring to Arduino, than the, in the 1700s, coined the term quaternary, so it is an Italian term, uh, but uh, uh, rather to those that when I was a young man or just before that, uh, made the history of this uh, field. From Blanc, father and son, with the uh, Circeo cave and uh, his Neanderthal, and uh, to Maria Bianca Cita, with a pioneer in the modern stratigraphy of the quaternary cycles in the Mediterranean, and many, many others that I cannot list because the list will be always incomplete. On the shoulder of these giants, many new researchers have emerged who are here in this room, assuming important roles within the International Union of Quaternary Research. The Italian quaternary community is very active in many different fields, 
from paleontology to seismology, from paleobotany to glaciology, from marine geology to paleoanthropology, from prehistoric archaeology to reconstruction of sea level variation, and I have to stop here because the list is always too long. Many INQUA committee president, vice president, journal editors are and, and were Italians. Not to mention that the fourth INQUA Congress, uh, the first one after World War II, was held in Rome and Pisa in 1953. And you will find an exhibition on this subject with the original material and specimen in exposition in one of the three poster areas. And um, in preparing this exhibition, we have come across a lot of fascinating material. Like uh, some was serious, like Milankovic, who uh, abandoned the, con the Congress uh, in Rome uh, after being interrupted by the session chair, because at that time there was a strong uh, fighting about uh, this strange theory of astronomical cycles controlling climate that then became reality. And other things are, are less serious. For example, uh, a, a dog that in Pisa uh, stole some bones of quaternary mammals and was uh, chased through the, through the street of, uh, of Pisa, or, or, or the Congress chair that, uh, um, that uh, punched the journalist because he didn't like an article, and it is not to say that we are doing that today. So this community, we thought uh, uh, over that year, deserved international recognition, and so we launched the audacious idea of proposing Italy as a candidate to host the Congress. Sapienza University, particularly Rector Gaudio, was in charge at that time, enthusiastically supported us, and we began working on proposing an over 700-year-old university venue, which certainly is not as convenient as a convention center, but provides a familiar environment for researchers, and not to be overlooked, helps in, key, helps in keeping registration costs low. Now, we Italians have strengths and weakness. Among the latter is the fact that we, are, we can be a bit anarchic and not overly disciplined, especially in teamwork, and we don't have an exceptionally efficient bureaucracy. These limitations have been evident in the organization of the Congress. But uh, digging into the box of strengths, we have found other characteristics, passion, inventiveness, a sense of community that allowed a group of about 20 people to work side by side without distinction of institution, age, geographical origin, and produce this Congress that we are about to open. As you will see, it's not just what you expected, but something more than solely for the pleasure of making this already beautiful event even more interesting for the large community of quaternary researchers worldwide. We have organized four exhibitions specifically for the Congress, you will find in the poster hall, arranged social events outside the university campus. The, the first one took place at sunset yesterday night in the Botanical Garden, and many of you uh, were there. One will be for the uh, early career researcher uh, tonight. And uh, we have prepared lunches that uh, we hope will honor our culinary tradition. And I personally fought against the idea of lunch boxes because in Italy we cannot do lunch boxes. And uh, we will have a couple of movies dealing with quaternary subject, guided visit to 10 uh, university museum, a special app to explore the travertine faces of cropping on the stones of, the, of this campus and, um, and uh, a comics that uh, you will find in the Congress bags. And then, thanks to the many students uh, volunteering from our university, who I thank sincerely, we have organized various activities, including children entertainment during a conference session. Some of you may have already had your Polaroid photo taken, which will serve as a souvenir if you find the staff wandering around in the campus. Sapienza University, has uh, supported us in a very strong way with its many, sometimes too many, offices to whom I extend my warm thanks, as well as the faculties and departments. And then to the scientific committee, which had to, to manage over 4,000 abstracts and to organize 14 parallel sessions that make up the Congress. We also had to organize about 20 field trips, pre, mid, and post Congress allowing researchers to visit the various outcrops that we have in our country, and I will come to this later. In addition to the Congress organization, we also coupled it with a major national scientific initiative. Four years ago, in another brewery, in Dublin this time, and at the 20th Congress, 
I don't want to give the impression that the quaternary researchers are heavy drinkers, but that, that was in, the, in that time. Immediately after winning uh, the bid for the organization of the, of, of the 21st Congress, uh, we launched the idea that uh, uh, to produce a quaternary map at the scale one to 500,000. The first version of this map will be presented here at the Congress and will be on display in one of the three poster holes. This bottom-up initiative endorsed, was endorsed by the Italian Association of Quaternary Studies and then by uh, CNR, that is the, um, the um, body that uh, um, found our, our participation in INQA, by NGV, OGS, and DISPRA, that is the cartographic service of the state. And uh, we produced uh, um, um, this map that we think will be something of reference for people managing the territory and the land for the decades to come. As we stated in the, intro, in the, in the booklet for the bid, uh, Italy is an open air encyclopedia of quaternary environments. From the coastal plain where stratigraphy has recorded sea level change, to the mountains of the Alps and the Apennines where geomorphology allows us to reconstruct the enormous glacial masses that shaped them until 20,000 years ago, from the continental carbonate deposit formed by the interaction between uh, carbonate-rich water from the Apennines and from the karstic sources, and we have fantastic caves. And then when they met uh, the hydrothermal springs uh, from the volcanic area on the coast, uh, they produced this travertine that you will find in the stone of our campus, to the uplifted marine terraces uh, that uh, describes the story of our planets. I must mention that the golden spike of the Gelasian stage, uh, which is the global reference point for the new quaternary boundary, at 2.59 million years is located in Gela, Sicily, and we offer a field trip to visit it. And then there is the marine geology, and as a marine geologist, I can help mention it, where all possible geodynamic environments from the Adriatic fore dip to the Ionian fore arc to the Tyrrhenian back arc generate incredibly diverse landscapes. This ranges from the vast plain exploding during glacial epochs where megafauna and Paleolithic hunters roamed around to deep batial plains with the Europe's largest active volcano, Marsili, in the Tyrrhenian Sea. That is not Etna. We have a field in Etna, but the, uh, the, uh, the highest uh, uh, active volcano is Marsili underwater. And then there are the active geological process, the breadth of planet Earth, its natural evolution, which unfortunately, when interacted with human infrastructure and settlements, can become disasters for our society. This includes active tectonics and earthquakes, active volcanoes, as well as flood and mass movement. All these natural phenomena are studied by quaternary science to better understand them. We, in our country, are well aware of this. Just recently, for instance, we had big floods in the Emilia-Romagna and Marche. This comprehension of how natural systems work is the task of our community. We aim to provide policymakers not with simple slogans, but with fundamental knowledge of land planning and for land planning and management and human activities. This is, there is a much talk about global change, and we will discuss it in, in our Congress since we deal with paleoenvironment, paleoclimate, paleo events. I don't need to remind you that only the quaternary perspective allows us to fully understand global changes to distinguish between trends and cyclicity, to define the intrinsic variability range of system, to identify controlling factor, often multiple and interacting, and thus discriminating, for example, between anthropogenic impacts and natural components of the change. However, global change is only part of the story. As quaternary researchers, we are also focused on local changes, and it's essential that global change does not become an irresponsibility shield for politics, in managing the local change caused by human activities. These changes are often in orders of magnitude larger than global changes. Example, poor management of river beds without considering the occurrence of exceptional but eventual centennial or millennial floods, coastal erosion caused by construction of dams in river channels or ports that alter the littoral transport, subsidence due to fluid extraction that may create a relative sea level rise, and inappropriate placement of critical infrastructure in seismic, hydrogeological, volcanic, high-risk areas. 
This is the social role of quaternary science, what the quaternary science are called to fulfill, and this Congress, in its capacity, will contribute to fulfill. Thank you. Yes. Okay, now I give the floor to uh, Teich uh, von Kolstofen, President of INQUA. Thank you very much. Dear Mr. President, dear Madam Minister, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's great to be in Rome today, and it's for me also a great honor as president of INQUA to say a few words about the Congress and especially also about INQUA. Today is a very important day for the Italian community. Since the bid was accepted in Dublin in 2019, the focus of many Italian scientists was on this day. And uh, of course, the whole process was shortly after the bid was accepted, was challenged by the pandemic situation. Several times we discussed, okay, what to do with the Congress? Shall we proceed? Um, and what moment we make the decision? And finally, with the support of the uh, Italian community, also with the support of Sapienza, there was this, the decision to go ahead and to organize this meeting. And thanks to all the efforts and all the support of Sapienza University and the big Italian community, we managed, and the start is there. I will come back to the organization also later in my speech. Already, <coughs> Professor Giocci told us how important the Italian community is for INQUA. And that's all, so uh, an example is the, 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 the meeting in 1953. Yeah, the importance of, Inc of Italy, Italy in that goes back to that period. Uh, INC was, was founded in 28, 1928, meeting in Denmark, and then it was followed by a, a meeting in, uh, in the USSR and then by, in Austria. And then there was a break of 17 years, and it was the Italian community under the leadership of Professor Blanc and his community around him to say, okay, we need to do something on this. And they initiated the, the, the Congress in 1953. And with that initiative also, they modernized INQUA in the sense that they make INQUA a global organization. They increase the number of disciplines. And actually the structure of INQUA, which we have nowadays, is going back to 53. And I think that's a very important uh, uh, to, to have that Italian input in this. It shows really not only how important the Italian community is in quaternary research, but also within a global uh, perspective. Um, so, but since 1953, of course, the world changed. Uh, Professor Giorgi already mentioned uh, the, the, the presentation of, of uh, Milankovic in 1953. And, a lot of people didn't believe what he was saying, right? the, the, the influence of uh, astronomical features on our climate. And this shows also, this is an example, how much changed since that period. When I was studying geology in the 1970s, my teachers told me that we are heading a, an ice age. And you won't believe it if you walk outside here. We just think, what, an ice age? Now, of course, nowadays, we don't think it's true, but that has to, that, that, that idea is based on the uh, enormous amount of data we collected since. And uh, so, so, but it's very important to have people like Milankovic also in these kind of congresses. Uh, he, he, what he presented was at that moment a very strange idea, but it took several decades before people accepted it. And this will be true also, of course, for nowadays, for the science nowadays, because also here, there will be some ideas presented where are maybe not true at the end, but some of them, they need time to be accepted. And it's very important to have many of these young scientists here which present their new and sometimes crazy ideas because this is science. This brings us further. 
And that's why it's so important to have this, uh, this meeting here. During the past, also, we are confronted with major changes. Uh, for example, the globalization, uh, the increase of mobility, communication, the availability of internet, access to email, confrontation with overwhelming amount of, of data. These developments had and still have a major impact on science in general. Our knowledge increased dramatically during the past decades. But we are also confronted with the erosion of trust in science. And this is also something which affects us all. And that's why we have to take the responsibility to also to work on outreach, to explain what we are doing. And this is important for, for the future also. And apart from these changes, we also experience changes in weather conditions, increasing temperatures, rising sea levels, loss of biodiversity. And we are more and more aware of the role of humans in, on this whole uh, processes. Time for change is the theme of the meeting. And it's an urgent call to reduce the negative human impact on the current changes. But the question is, what is the human component in the course of these changes? And what is the future impact of these changes? The key of these questions are in the past, in the quaternary, the area where, where we, uh, the area that is characterized by numerous climatic fluctuations, changing sea, sea level, major repeating changes in biota. Quaternary scientists are studying these changes during the past two and a half million years, and they observe the impact of these changes, they collect data and design models that can be used to predict the future. The past decade is characterized by major discoveries. The main discoveries in the past 10, 15 years are in laboratories, not so much in the field. Uh, in the laboratories, we find all kinds of new data. The increase of biological data, for instance, and the particularly the bio biomolecular data extracted from tiny fossil samples and now as even from sediments, the amount of data is overwhelming and the results are very spectacular. The latest ancient DNA data show, for example, the complexity of the history of our own species, the interbreeding between modern humans and Neanderthals. The ancient DNA shows also the existence of additional hominin species like the Denisovans. These data show, show also the complexity of our history and the way we migrated over the globe. And for instance, another example is the research recently published on Greenland. In Greenland, they found molecular data in deposits which are about two million years old. And these data increased our knowledge of the, the biodiversity at that moment, because we found all kinds of signals which are not found in the fossil record so far. And this shows the potential of this type of research. In the past decade, quaternary scientists also made major progress in dating of the different events, with the result that we now deal with less uncertainties. Speaking about progress, it's also worth to mention the increase of knowledge about sea level change and about correlation between marine and continental realms. So together, we are collecting a huge amount of data and the data that can be used to model for model studies. And in the near, near future, artificial intelligence will help us to, to recognize patterns. This is one of the new developments we are facing. The program of this Congress emphasized the critical role of quaternary science in this. INQUA, as a representative body of quaternary science worldwide, should have a major role in this debate and take the lead also. INQUA's goal is to promote improved communication, uh, communication and international cooperation. Taking the lead in this such a debate implies that we uh, should building bridges, we should building bridges between the different organizations, between the different unions. We are already doing something together with PAGES, but we can also do something together with the International Union of Biological Sciences. This union is re representing biologists who are studying the present day loss of biodiversity. 
And if you look at the fossil record, also we see a lot of changes in the biodiversity in the past. If you think about that in the period between 40,000 and 30,000 years ago, there were huge changes in climate, huge fluctuations. And these fluctuations had an enormous impact on the biodiversity. A lot of species went to genetic bottlenecks because of the redu reduction of their population size. And these kind of uh, knowledge can be very useful to see what is the impact of the current changes we are facing. And that's why it's so important that biologists and quaternary scientists work together. And we should work together more and more in this. And INQUA should take the lead and make, build these bridges. Especially if you want to know something about the resilience of the biomes or what are the critical tipping points. We only can do that if you look at the past. A big challenge for INQUA and as well as for other scientific unions is is also incorporating the global south. Uh, the region that is heavily affected by the current changes and therefore it should be an important focus of INQA. The first step we made was the launch of an INQA fellowship program and uh, there are some open access waivers for authors from the global south, but we, we must do more. This is not enough. We have to break down the barriers for example, in the INQUA studies and bylaws to prevent the full integration of the people from those countries. Time for change is the theme of the meeting, but it's not only, I mean, it uh, applies to, to the reduction of our footprint, it also applies to a change in our attitude. And the key word, in my view, is solidarity. Recently, I saw an interview given by a colleague of you, Mr. President, it was an interview by <coughs> uh, the president of Brazil, uh, Lula da Silva, and he spoke about solidarity. It was an interview when he, that he gave when he was visiting China. And it was so impressive to see that, that interview. And he was trying to explain the importance of solidarity. But, but when I speak about solidarity, what do I mean with solidarity? Let me give you an example. When I came in Rome here to discuss the, uh, the Congress here, I, was <clears throat> I met our Italian colleagues, and then I noted that they wanted to do it together. No professional organization, no conference center, no conference convention. No, we will do it together as community. And that's a big challenge. And you can only do this if, you have, if the base of this group is solidarity. And this is what I noticed here, and I thought, okay, this is important. Solidarity instead of rivalry or competition. And also this uh, organization, this Congress shows what you can achieve if you have solidarity as the base of your organization. <clears throat> and with this example in mind, we should increase our support for colleagues from the Global South. But there are also others who need our support. We also need to be in solidarity with colleagues from Colleagues that are affected by rivalry between countries, colleagues that suffer directly or indirectly from the political crisis in different parts of the world, we also need to support them. And another challenge for INQA is to support the early career scientists. It's good to see that so many early career scientists are attending the, this meeting. They are the future leading scientists. However, most of the young scientists are nowadays under huge pressure and many have unstable or no future pers perspective. We must improve the situation. We must improve the conditions on which they are working. A young scientist is not an octopus. And for those who want to see more about it and, 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 and understand why they are not an octopus, there is a, this afternoon a poster which shows why they are not an octopus. And they also need our support. We need to be in solidarity with them. Solidarity itself is a nice word, but it only works if it's combined with responsibility. Strong shoulders should take the responsibility and combine it with solidarity. Responsibility is not only linked with financial support, it's more than that. There are different ways to express, express our uh, solidarity. And INQA as organization can be, can be and should be instrumental in this. A Congress like this, offers the 
perfect possibility to show our solidarity, to support each other, to inspire each other, and to embrace each other. With the organization of the INQUA Congress, Time for Change, our Italian colleagues created a great platform for, fruit, for fruitful communication, for exchanging data and hypotheses, and for discussion. And at the end the meet, of the meeting, it will result in important recommendations, recommendations that will form the base of, our, of the INQUA agenda for the next inter-Congress inter period. Please enjoy the INQUA Congress, enjoy the in-person meeting, enjoy the venue of Rome, enjoy Rome. Thank you very much. I now have the honor of passing the floor to the Minister of University and Research, Honorable Anna Maria Bernini, whose dedication to promote scientific excellence and fostering collaboration between academia, industry, and government is common knowledge. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, my heartfelt thanks to President Mattarella for being here. I also thank the President of INQUA Congress, Professor Francesco Chiocci, for his kind invitation, and the Vice-Rector of Sapienza University, Professor Giuseppe Ciccarone, who is hosting us. I extend my greetings to the vast international community of scholars who have chosen Rome to meet in these days and to the president of International Union for Quaternary Sciences, Professor Taish Pan Kulfschoten. It is a pleasure to attend a large international congress like this in the largest university in Europe. The fact that your scientific community has been meeting for almost a hundred years constitutes a great example and during these days it involves more than 3,000 delegates from more than 100 countries. This is an impressive accomplishment. On our Earth, geological dynamics have followed one another at the pace of hundreds of millions of years a path that humanity joined only in the latest segment. We are the product of never-ending transformation and we live our lives within this transformation. Thanks to your help, we will also have a clearer vision of the real impact of human activities on the environment. You have chosen to focus on the subject time for change. And real change comes through a deep study of specialized branches of science, such as those that focus on the quaternary. What's past is prologue. This sentence from William Shakespeare embodies also the relevance of your own research for contemporary life. Thanks to the various specializations you represent, it is possible to understand the climatic dynamics that we are experiencing and that we have to face nowadays. Your research can offer us great knowledge on the climate, on the biogeochemical cycles of the planet, on the effects of key changes on living beings. All forms of life, including our ancestors, have always resorted to adaptation mechanisms. Our most successful adaptation strategy today is represented by scientific research. Our ministry is deeply involved in this change through a series of, of investments. As an example, let me mention the Geom Sciences IR project led by ISPRA which will deepen and share key geological analysis. To understand our past and our present, 
and particularly to build our future. We need more advanced computational skills. The fourth most powerful computer in the world operates in Italy, supporting Italian and European research. And we need better connectivity. The Terabit project will create by 2025 an integrated network infrastructure with very high computing and data transmission performance open to scientific communities throughout Italy, removing gaps in access. Our ecosystem of research infrastructures is continuously expanding, luckily. I refer, for instance, to the new permanent volcanological observatory in Antarctica, managed by National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology and the University of Catania, and to the Pianosa Research Base on a National Research Council. These initiatives will provide us with data on the evolution of unique contexts. I would now like to draw your attention to the essential role of science in modern societies. I think a key challenge of our time is making science visible and tangible to the general public, to the public engagement. We started addressing this topic at the last G7 in Sendai, Japan, and this will be a key area for Italy's G7 next year. Large assemblies and congresses such as this one and the innovative research on crucial aspects of the Earth's dynamic system will miss their goal if they fail to impose their own value in public debate. Young students and researchers must be aware they can contribute to the collective well-being. Research topics that often are not in the spotlight allow us to study the foundation of reality we live in. You know that, but not enough people are aware of that. It is our common responsibility to put research in the spotlight, to build a positive agenda on the role of science in debates of global relevance, such as this one. To maximize the social value of these efforts, I think the scientific community needs to make a further effort to open up. Researchers are civil servants who can have a strong impact on a society. Modern communication systems allow us, allow you, to reach anyone and spread contents of high value. You have the power to educate, to increase the awareness of citizens and decision makers, such as we are. You have the power to highlight important connections between a past that is considered remote in human terms and the evolution of our planet to make complexity accessible. And we fail our service to citizens if we lack an effective communication of science. I believe the thought of French philosopher Edgar Morin can help us in this endeavor. He once wrote that we need a kind of thinking that relinks that which is disjointed, that respects diversity as it recognizes unity. Thanks to you all for breaking barriers among disciplines and for building enduring scientific connections. Best wishes for this Congress and to you all have a best, nice weekend in Italy. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Minister. So uh, now I declare open the 21st Inqua Congress and we will have some music before the President will leave. But uh, for now, the Congress is open.
per musica su Roma si esibiscono adesso Alessandro Liberatore tenore Isidora Moles Spassic soprano Roberto Lorenzetti pianista
tua fredda stanza guardi le stelle che tremano d'amore e di speranza ma il mio mistero è chiuso in me Nessuno ne saprà, no, no, sulla tua bocca la dirò, quando la luce splenderà. Ed il mio padre, Scioglierò il silenzio che ti fa mia.
And now we start with the General Assembly of our 21st Congress of INQUA. So, if you want to stay, we are glad to have you, but if you have your work to do away, thank you for coming. And now, and now I invite the members of the editorial board, of the executive board to come to the desk. A, a general announcement, please, if we could have your attention. The ceremony is still underway. If you could kindly take your seats. We shall progress with the ceremonies. There will be award presentations and medali presented. If you would kindly have a seat, if you plan to stay.
dear participants, may I ask you to take a seat. We would like to follow the opening ceremony, to continue with the opening ceremony. And there will be some announcements, there will be some middle. So please take your seat, we want to continue. Please take a seat. We are going to start with the General Assembly. Please, please don't leave the room. People from Inqua, we are going to start here. Riprendete gli indiani. Riprendi gli indiani. Yeah, they're not, they don't understand, so. No, I, I don't but know. what I should they say? Mm. Okay, we're going to commence in two minutes. Please sit down, please sit down. There will be a medals ceremony and other inqua business. Please have a seat and we shall begin in one minute. Thank you for your patience. Please settle down. Okay, now we need a meditative moment. Quiet down, please. If I can have silencio, per favore. Grazie mille. Penso. Laura. We're going to begin the INQUA General Assembly Congress meeting. There will be a medal ceremony and other INQUA business, and we shall commence in a moment. Can you please start the PowerPoint presentation of this meeting, please? Okay, thank you very much. We'd like to start now the General Assembly meeting of this uh, Congress. And the first thing I would like to, to explain is what is actually the General Assembly. A lot of people probably don't understand and don't know what the General Assembly is. General Assembly is here is this group of people here. These are the people who are attending the Congress. They are part of the big international quaternary research uh, group of people studying the quaternary research. They are clustered in uh, associations which are from different countries. These countries are represented, are member of the INQUA organization, they are represented in the International Council. The International Council is electing an INQUA executive and there is also a group of commissions which are elected and they are both, this, they form the INQUA board and they try to serve the community by making all kinds of decisions. But finally, it's the International Council who has to ratify the decisions and even the International Council is then uh, have, all the decisions have to be approved by the General Assembly. So it's the 
the community who is present at the International Council of it, at the International Congress. Here I would like to introduce you the, uh, the members of the executive. We have Secretary General, Eniko Machiari, Inqua Treasurer, Frank Bushes. Um, we have Vice Presidents for Shen Tengao from China, Laura Sadori from Italy, Lynn Quick from South America, and then we have Maria Fernanda Sanchez Goni from France. We have a past president, Ellen Ashworth, and then in addition, since more than one and a half year, we have also a secretary who's supporting the INCO organization, and many of you uh, have connections, uh, have received emails, saw the, the, uh, uh, the INCO news, monthly newsletter, all kind of things which are actually produced by uh, Aratina Haliuk. Um, I would like to say a few words over the past, uh, about the past intra-Congress period. Um, we started in 2019 and you can of course imagine that this was not a normal intra-Congress period. Shortly after we were elected and we started our work, the pandemic situation started and actually it took, uh, uh, it had influence on our entire intra-Congress period. Uh, we had only one meeting with the board and all the other meetings were via Zoom. Our <coughs> mission is also to organize meetings, to support meetings, but many of these meetings could not take place. So it was really in this aspect a very strange situation. And then in addition to that also is the political uh, crisis we are dealing with. I uh, want to mention the war in, in, in Ukraine and of course Scientists from Russia, they are very important in uh, the organization of INQA in the past. They already, since the start of INQA, they played a major role. And it is, of course, a pity that due to the, the political situation, they were not able to attend this meeting. And for me personally also, it's, it's a pity that uh, people like Guzel and Aisha and Alexei and Sasha and Marina, Evgenia, Alexander, all people which I worked with for a long time, Dima, Fadim, Andre, they cannot be here, and this is a pity. But anyhow, this is the situation, and we will hope that it will improve uh, very quickly. INQUA's mission is to facil facilitate co uh, collaboration among scientists around the world to support meetings. And what we notice also, that due to the lack of meetings, there was a uh, dramatic uh, decrease of communication and the communication with our community uh, was really under pressure and uh, that's why we finally decided we need some way of communication and that's why we decided to launch the um, INQA newsletter, the monthly newsletter in which you are informed about activities, about projects, about possibilities. And speaking about projects, <coughs> Also, in the past Inca Congress period, um, we dealt with 40 uh, project applications and we financed these, these projects. All, not all meetings took place. And uh, there are, uh, although there were some very successful uh, meetings, uh, I want to mention Mapping Ancient A Africa, one of the most successful projects, because what they did, they organized not one big meeting, but they organized regional hubs to avoid the, 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 the problems we are facing in the past years. And they man managed to, to have really a very good uh, collaboration between the different uh, groups in Africa, in Europe, and in America. And uh, some of them will present their results uh, here at the Congress, and I really would like to, to encourage you to, to visit these uh, meetings to hear their talks and to also look at their posters. Uh, one of the major changes is also the, the, um, the establishment of the INQA Secretariat. Uh, launching a newsletter means a lot of work and we needed really support and it's, we were very grateful that, uh, <coughs> that Anatina Haliuk was supporting us. Um, wait a moment, there's something going wrong here. Sorry. 
One of the things we also developed in the past two, day, two years was the INCO Fellowship Program. We were thinking about how to support young scientists, and especially young scientists from South America, from Africa, from Asia, from countries where the possibilities to have research money are limited. And that's why we, uh, we launched the uh, INCO Fellowship Program. And altogether, we had 26 applications, and we elected uh, 14 of them, and they will be awarded now. And I will ask now to play the first video clip. This is about... My name is Lauren Pretorius. Sebastián Richano. Joaquín Arroyo Cabrales. I would like to ask the fellows to come to the stage now. Please. I'm from Mexico. I am from Morocco. I'm from Argentina. And I'm a PhD candidate from Athens, Greece. I study fossil insects from lake sediments to reconstruct past climates. Carbonate diagenesis and bioenvironmental reconstruction. Bio landscape evolution in fluvial lacustrine like environment and its relationship with Mesoamerican societies. Coastal geomorphology. Active pause through paleosmological studies in catch basin. The impact of precipitation and temperature shifts during lead Pleistocene. Paleoclimate and the past atmospheric circulation of the southern hemisphere through the inspection of mineral dust recovered from lowest and palisol sequences. Sedimentology and ignology of marine quaternary deposits in Patagonia. The climatic and environmental conditions which have developed in the southern Red Sea during the last 30,000 years. Value salinity and temperature stratification reconstruction over northern Indian Ocean during the past 25,000 years. My research focuses on the late Pleistocene mammal taxonomy and biogeography. Late Holocene sea level. Holocene paleoclimatology and paleoecology using peatland records. Mineral dust and its effects on climate and paleoclimate. As an INCOA fellow, I do my research here at the University of Milano Bicocca in Milan, Italy. In Ecolab in the city of Toulouse, France. Heidelberg University in Germany. University of Pisa in Italy. At the Institute of Environmental Geology in Rome, in Italy. La Sapienza University in Rome. Instituto per lo Studi degli Ecosistemi in Verbania Palanza, in Italia. The Free University of Berlin, Germany. The University of Durham, in the UK. The University of Lausanne, Switzerland. With the support from INQUA, I'm here at the Cultural Institute of Technology, Germany. The Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. I'm an INQUA Fellow at the Department of Earth and Marine Sciences, University of Palermo. At the University of Venice, in Italy. We are very pleased to have such a group of talented scientists here on the stage. Thank you very much. One of the ways INQUA is serving the community is also by publications of journals. And we are, of course, uh, uh, we are publishing together with Elsevier, Quaternary International, an important uh, journal for the quaternary science community. And uh, <coughs> this is actually the, the team. We started off in 2019 without a, a real editorial team, and we used the intra-Congress period to establish this team. And I would like to introduce you uh, uh, to Jules Xiao. He's the editor and current editor-in-chief, and there are a number of editors. Hema Akutian, one of the editors, Maria Barret Azarin, Alexander Franke, Quincy Hao, Pierre Luigi Pericini, Patrick Roberts, Jan Bernstut, Andrea Saboni, and I was 
past editor-in-chief in the first period of the Inter-Congress period. For the International, this team was very, very, very active, uh, editing a lot of papers. And you see here how many issues have been published in the past Inter-Congress period. So altogether, regular issues 46, and special issues 75. You can imagine how much work it was for the team to get these journals, to get these issues published. And they are well cited. Here you see one of the top cited papers from that uh, past period. And I would like to invite you to have a look at the INQA uh, Quaternary International booth uh, next to the Elsevier booth. During the past decade, we often were discussing whether there is a need for a new journal or not. Uh, that has, first of all, it was based on the fact that the number of submissions was so big sometimes, sometimes more than 1,500 submissions a year, that we discussed a new journal. But for a long time, we decided, no, no, no. And every time I said, no, 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 it's already very difficult to, to get an editorial team for one journal. So I don't want to start a second journal because it's, it's difficult. But finally, we managed, we discussed it over and over again, and just about one year ago, discussing it again with Elsevier, we decided, okay, we will try it. We'll give it a try to start a new journal. And uh, I would like to show you the next video clip. Study of quaternary environmental and human evolution has been revolutionized by new discoveries, the application of new research methods, and new analytical methods. Quaternary environment and humans will focus on four pillars. Geo-archaeology, including landscape archaeology, and the use of natural resources. Bio-archaeology, the reconstruction of the environment, exploitation of animal and plant resources, and the way we have evolved to become the lone global custodian of the planet. Material culture, including examination of technology and objects, and raw material analysis, Modeling studies. Quantify multi-proxy perspectives and innovative applications of spatial analysis. Quaternary Environment and Humans is an open access journal. By Elsevier and Inkpa. We are pleased to launch this, uh, this uh, new journal and the launch, the official launch will be during lunchtime at the Elsevier booth and you're invite, invited to go there to celebrate the lunch. There will be some drinks, extra drinks to celebrate really this, the start of this new journal. And I would like to introduce you to the team which is starting this journal. Editor-in-chief will be Andrea Saboni from Italy. There will be an, Editors, associate editors will be Sylvia Bello, Fumi Yusuka, Uzusuki, and Jan Kolar. We had a long discussion, we had many Zoom meetings to establish the board and to establish also the aim and scope of the journal, to invite people to join the editorial board. And this afternoon we have the first editorial board meeting, and you saw that already the <clears throat> the journal is open for submission. And I also would like to uh, uh, draw your attention to Shishan Zhao. She's the publisher, the LCV publisher of the new journal, including also the LCV publisher of Quarter International. And we as INQUA organization, we are very grateful to the cooperation with, with uh, Elsevier and all the, uh, the meetings we had together to discuss the launch of this new journal 
and we are really very confident that this journal will be a big success with the help of Elsevier, with the help of you. And it's important to realize that in one way or the other, if you were thinking about supporting Elsevier, people think the only support from Elsevier comes from the members, from the countries, they paying the fees. One way to support INQA as organization is to publish in one of these journals. This is really a very important signal and it is also financially very important that you publish in these journals. And I really would like to encourage you to publish in these journals. This journal is an open access journal and especially the first period, the open access, uh, the open access fees will be waived to get this journal very quickly at a high standard level. So really we encourage you to, uh, <coughs> to, uh, to launch this journal and to support this journal. So the formal launch, as I said, is today during lunch time at the LSV booth. Please join us. But also there are meetings like the meet and greet the editors of both journals at Monday during lunch time. The next item on the agenda of the General Assembly is the awards. As you know, INQA has three types of awards and during the Congress, these awards will be uh, uh, presented and uh, the election will be, <coughs> will be uh, official. And uh, we have the so-called Nick Shackleton uh, Award for Outstanding Young Sci Quarterly Scientist. We have the Li Tu Cheng Distinguished Career Medal for Distinguished Service to the International Community in Quarterly ser Service and the INQA Distinguished Server Medal. I would like to start with the uh, Nick Shackleton Medal for uh, Outstanding Young Scientist. This is the, uh, the, the recipients in the past. Uh, you see a list of very uh, good, famous scientists and it's really outstanding if you end up at this list is really a, a, a big honor. Probably some of you already know and saw in Quaternary Perspective that we, of course, we have the Shackleton Medal is awarded every second year and the medal for the 2021 medal, uh, there were four nominees, Alexander Franke, uh, <coughs> Daniel, Enrique Ibarra, Eleonora Regattieri and Julie Loisel. And <coughs> Uh, the winner of that uh, award in 2021 was finally was Julie Lucell. So I would like to see the next video clip and in between I would like to ask Julie to come to the stage. Hi, my name is Julie Loisel and I'm a professor of geography at Texas A&M University in the United States. My research helps determine the sensitivity of peatland ecosystems to past climate changes. Peatlands are very small ecosystems when you look at them at the global scale, but they matter a lot in the global carbon cycle because they have stored about one third of the global soil carbon stock throughout the Holocene. What my group does really is two main things. The first is that we look at peatlands from all over the world and we quantify their carbon stocks. The second is that we look at the stratigraphy of the peatlands and we reconstruct their paleo history from their inception all the way to present time using a range of proxy indicators, including pollen, plant fossils, tested amoeba, stable isotopes, and others, so that we can determine when the peatlands were warmer or cooler or wetter or drier, so that we can get a better understanding of how the climate has changed in the past. I suppose my group has also contributed quite a bit in creating um, an environment where we can share and exchange knowledge about peatlands. So this is something that has been very important through my, uh, my career so far. I'm delighted and honored to be receiving the Sir Nick Shackleton Medal today. Thank you. Okay, please. The award will be presented by Laura Sadori, the, the chair of the award commission. Please. Thank you very much. And now is the time to announce the winner of the uh, 
2023 Shackleton Medal nominees. There are two nominees, Petra Rupnik. Petra is an outstanding scientist who invest investigates terrestrial processes, deposits, and history, as well as stratigraphy and chronology. She's active mostly in the territory of Slovenian, Southern Alps, and the Pre-Alps, where moderate seismic and active tectonics prove an ongoing tectonic deformation due to collision of the Adria microplate with a Eurasian plate responsible for the dynamic ridge formation in the intramontane basins. She's primarily investigating active tectonic deformations and thanks to her research, active faults have been recognized. Sorry, first I should have shown this. So Petra is one of the nominees. The second one is Kumai Fu from China. Kumai is an exceptional, talented and brilliant scientist. She, was pro she has profound knowledge in laboratory techniques, in bioinformatics and in pollution genetics and has again and again showed that she can develop these techniques to promote quaternary research and make new things possible. Kumai is among the most talented ancient DNA researchers to have emerged in recent years. Her skill in extraction and preparation of ancient DNA has enabled her to generate DNA sequences from even the most difficult ancient specimens. And this has opened up the possibility to study the history of modern humans. Kumai has contributed significantly to a number of major findings in Pleistocene and Holocene ancient DNA in the past five years and is recognized as a leader research in this field. Kumai had an impressive list of awards and one of them is she was selected as one of the young global leaders of the 2020 World Economic Forum. The winner of the Nick Shackleton 23 medal is Dear all, I'm Chao Mei Fu, a paleogenetic research from the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology of Chinese Organic Science. It's in my great honor to receive this important award. Through over 15 years engagement in quantitative research, I mainly used the Asian DNA to tracing the history about early morning humans across in Eurasia and the, the population dynamic of humans in East Asia from the later Paleolithic to Holocene. For human environment interactions, I'm interested on in what happens to the morning human in Eurasia during the last ice age. We found the population changes and uh, some adaptive variation appears after the last glacial maximum. For example, in Europe, the blue ice appears around 40,000 years ago. And in East Asia, the gene related to the sinking hair shaft and the more sweet glands appears at least around 19,000 years ago. We also have a lot of interesting work related to East Asia. Here, I just want to mention some of them. For example, 100,000 years Denisova DNA was found in the sediment of Tibetan Plateau. A distinct unknown East Asian ancestor existed 11,000 years ago was not found today. An origin in Southern China was found for proto austronation there are still a lot of important chapters unveiled in the history of human genetics. I will continue to trace the misery. Thank you. The next one is the Li Tu Cheng Distinguished Career Medal for Distinguished Service to the International Community in Quaternary Research. Previous medal recipients were Nicholas Lick, Lancaster, Anne Windel, and Stephen Porter. This year we had a nominee, and this, his name is DJ, sorry, Denise DJ Rousseau. He was nominated for this, and <coughs> If you read the reports,
from the, those who are nominating and also from the award committee who looked at the nomination. And it is said that Didier Rousseau is a world leader in the study of continental paleoclimate, with particular emphasis on study of LUS. His work spans several fields of study, such as geology, paleoecology, paleoclimatology, and atmospheric sciences, allowing him to combine pioneer, pioneering field studies, high quality data, and insightful interpretation. In addition to his own research, he is taking a leading role in numerous in national and international initiatives, offering exceptional service to several communities within the field of quaternary science. He was granted several prestigious awards during his career, among which are the French CNRS Silver Medal in 2007, and abroad the Humboldt Gay Lussac Prize in 2004, and the AU Union Service Award in 2008, and in 2017 the AU Hans Utscher Medal. He also served the INQUA community. He was a member of the executive from 2000 from 1989 to 2003, and he was a French delegate at the uh, Reno uh, Congress in Berlin. And with his, such a high level of scientific contribution, wide experience to quaternary studies and deep involvement at the service of the scientific community, Denise DJ Rousseau fully deserves <coughs> the awarded uh, 20, 000, uh, sorry, 2023 Li Cheng Distinguished Career Medal. May I ask you to come on the stage? This is a nice slide from the <laughs> Sorry, this slide summarizes a little bit. He's a world leader. He has a leading roles in, in, in initiatives, offering exceptional service, and he has a foresight step to found one of the leading journals. So really a person who deserves this award. Thank you. And now we are coming to the distinguished, uh, INQUA Distinguished Service Medal. Previous medal winners were Ned Rutter and Marie Franz Luther, the current president of the Pages. And this year we had two nominations, um, Norm Cato from Canada and Alessandro Maria Michetti from Italy. It was not so easy to, um, to make a decision on this. If you look at the uh, at the nominations, it's interesting to see that, that of course, for, let me start with Alessandro Michetti. And one of the nominators said, I cannot think of anyone who is more deserving than, El, as El, <coughs> than Alessandro for this important recognition. So in their view, there's only one person should, who should get it. <coughs> Professor Michetti's exuberant in his contribution to quaternary science as well as to the INCO organizations are really great. Not only is he an outstanding and collegial person, he is a passionate and talented scientist who significantly elevated and promoted quaternary science and the INCO missions. And he has continued to do so through um, all the efforts over the past decades. Over the years, he served as a highly effective leader <coughs> of F, as well as IQA, his position in INQA as TEFPRO president was an important one, and he investigated significant efforts to foster and maintain the high scientific level of the commission. He promoted the co creation of several research networks, and he supported the inclusion of many scientists across multiple disciplines, which has sustainable increase on the diversity of the TEFPRO community. We appreciate how much effort, enthusiasm, energy, strength uh, of what he brought in, and, we <coughs> and especially when he, what he gave to the uh, visibility of TEFRO in general, but also INQUA as, <coughs> as a general organization. So to summarize, there's only one person who deserves this. 
And we have denominators of non-Catholic. Non Cato, we also got nomination letters and we looked at it, and our award committee looked at it. <coughs> and um, they stated that the INCRA Distinguished Service Medal, as well as deserved recognition for Dr. Cato, uh, they really want to nominate him because of his, what they call, heroic efforts on behalf of the entire international community, especially the, all the work he did for Quarterly International. He made an exemplary contribution to the quaternary science through his selfish, selfless leadership of quaternary international. As you know, INCRA has maintained close ties to quaternary international and INCRA officers were closely involved in the founding of quaternary international in 1987. And I know from a story from Norm Cato that he was a PhD student in Canada and uh, Ned Rutter, the president of INCWA, was his supervisor and the INCWA executive decided that they would like to establish a journal. And when uh, Ned Rutter came back from that meeting, he stepped into the office of, of Noam Kato and I said, I have a nice job for you to do. Please, set up the journal. Uh, so Ned Rutter was the formal uh, editor-in-chief, but actually from the first moment on, the first paper was already edited by Norm Cato. And <clears throat> one of the interesting thing is also, he is, of course, Norm Cato is, a, is of course also a, a distinguished uh, geomorphologist and reading expert in, in landscape and landforms. His publication record is very big and his record of engagement with general public across the remarkable broad range of forums is really endless. The countless hours that Norm toiled for the community should be rewarded. In my opinion, it is that, INCRA, that the INCRA Distinguished Service Medal is the perfect vehicle in, for doing this. Having served on the INCRA executive, I believe that there is no one more deserving this award as Neom Kato. So we are <coughs> dealing with two excellent persons. And let me show you who finally was the winner. Unfortunately, we cannot, uh, Noam Carter could not attend uh, the meeting uh, because of some private circumstances, and so that's why we will present him the, the award and the medal, of course, as soon as we will 
are in the opportunity to do so. So please, once more, let's celebrate <laughs> Don Kaku. And of course, I would like to, uh, as an exception, I would like also have Alexander on the stage to give him at least the, the fact that you are awarded, you will get a certificate for that. Please. Okay, this brings us to the end of this uh, General Assembly first meeting of the General Assembly. There will be a second meeting at the end of the Congress. There we will announce the honorary members. We also will announce a change in the executive. And there will be more surprises. So please attend the second General Assembly meeting, July 20 at 2 o'clock. soon again during the Congress or at the General Assembly meeting on the 20th. Thank you very much.